Our second speaker um, comes from my alma mater, one of my alma maters. I was a bit of an institutional slut, I must admit. And Edith Cowan was one of uh, where, where I did my Bachelor of Fine Arts. Donna is, uh, is currently a lecturer in uh, Cultural History and Theory at the School of Communications and Art, Edith Cowan University. Um, she has collaborated on art science projects since her residency at Symbiotica, and you all all know Symbiotica very well, at the, at the uh, Centre of Excellence in Biological Arts at the University of WA. Um, sh she um, received a, an APA scholarship and also an Excellence in Research scholarship to actually follow on from uh, her work at Science Symbiotica, and um, it is a delight to have you come from the West to be with us. Thank you very much, Donna. Uh, thank you, Barb, for that lovely introduction. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yep, thank you. Uh, just before I show you the first slide, I'm just going to premise with a couple of personal anecdotes, just to set the scene, you could say. Uh, Habermas talks about how our life world shapes how we engage with everyday experiences. And as a child, uh, my mother being a nurse would often come home with organs. <laughs> now, not organs from the hospital, but organs obviously from the, the butchers. And uh, one of our favorite pastimes would be to dissect these things and discuss how they worked. Another thing she also was fond of doing was cutting open uh, pets once they had died. Uh, so um, we, had a, we had chickens, and of course when they pass away naturally, as, as everything does, uh, she would uh, dissect poor Penny the Henny and uh, show me her insides and tell me how these work. And it's quite intriguing for me to know the most vivid thing I remember from that experience when I was about five uh, was the bright yellow colour inside just like the inside of an egg. And also the fact that Penny the Henny had a string of pearls, which were her eggs. So like ourselves, uh, she was born with all of her ovums uh, as she gestated in her mother's womb um, and carried that throughout her life as well. So there's a lovely connection there to start with. Uh, thinking about what we've, what we've extraordinarily experienced over the past three days, uh, is that we're all talking about the generation of knowledge and how we learn from experience and from the past and how we use this engagement with the materiality of the present uh, to draw on what has uh, gone before us. Uh, but what if uh, the present has no precedence or theoretical underpinning that determines its future? And with that in mind, I will take you to the first slide. Okay, so developing biotechnologies are rapidly transforming our relationships and understandings of what constitutes life and the non-human. Did you ever consider in your lifetime that you would come across a mouse with an ear on its back? In relation to this also are the close relationships between systems and politics. We also have increased high density living and urban spread which is causing a form of am environmental amnesia. And this continues to frame our day-to-day -day engagements with local wildlife. Many argue that our values are ill-equipped to deal with this new knowledge and the implications of manipulating life. Media representation, political agenda, influence the public's attitude towards uh, technologies and the science behind them. Think of the uh, riots in relation to climate change and carbon tax that we've had and the scientists that receive death threats from the public. Um, what everyone has been talking about throughout the three days is looking at the gaps that are identified through research. Uh, what came across for me through my own experiences is the need to ethically consider what we do as artists who work with living materials. In terms of my background, uh, to define things as biological arts, in a sense, can be potentially reductive. So what is more important for me is this negation between the arts and the life sciences through hands-on experience and embodiment. 
for me, it's an interdisciplinary approach that traverses cultural and global contexts because we're talking about big issues. We're talking about life and death and what constitutes life. We're also talking about the impact of technology on how we live on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about mobile phones and the internet and how that's profoundly shaped our understanding of who we are but how we act out our culture. Uh, what uh, the subject matter within the bioarts is incredibly diverse, as Maria has demonstrated just with one particular um, example. Uh, and this is its potency, its diversity. During my residency at Symbiotica, when I was doing my masters, it was a cross-institutional um, situation. Uh, what was important is that the artists understood the science and appreciated its context, but used it as an artistic medium through the process of wet biology. As Stellark states, it's about creating meaningful encounters with the unknown as it develops in real time. Uh, these particular works, I'll just give you a brief contextualization. During my masters, I produced a garment out of fungus because I was particularly interested in that history of textiles and fungus and uh, I was seeking people that uh, had an interest in fungus. So I went to a lot of mycological conferences and my first introduction to the mycologists, who I thought were gonna be quite stuffy, uh, which of course is a cultural assumption, <laughs> was a whole s ring of bottoms and they were all looking at something on the ground that was almost invisible with great enthusiasm. So I found some people that were just as crazy as me, so that was really lovely. Uh, the work on the left is an ongoing collaborative project I have with a scientist, Gary Cass, and this is, um, can you guess what the, uh, the garment up the top is made from just by looking at it? And I'll just point out it is not a photoshopped image. Blood, no. It, is, it was originally a liquid though. Pardon? Yes, wine, wine. So in response to the, the cartoon. So this is a garment grown from wine and bacteria. And what happened through this process of disseminating it into the public sphere is that of course it was mediated by, by many cultural um, discourses. And I think they've depicted my collaborator quite well there down the bottom. <laughs> so in order to uh, reclaim this work, we would often go into high schools and conduct workshops with students. And this became sort of the starting point for my PhD. What was particularly of concern to me was that a lot of young people are having very little time um, to engage with the natural world these days. I've noticed just from observations that people often walk around with headphones in all the time and they're missing things like the wind, the birds singing, obviously the traffic, but uh, you know, just, just that actually being in the present and engaging with that. And this was really quite evident at this project when I um, brought interdisciplinary practices into the education system. So what I did is I brought life workshops into the laboratory, I mean, into um, art contexts through hands-on experience, and I, I, I gave it a broad overview of biology from invertebrates, bacteria, human DNA, animal biology. And we also had multiple teachers in the project, so you have many different levels of experience and position um, informing the event. And what was also important is that the topics engage with uh, current technological developments and environmental issues. And some of the students were really quite freaked out by the smells and the textures and uh, having, being a close proximity to insects. And they were quite shocked to see how many insects you can actually find in a garden, the diversity. And of course, as Maria was saying, we're still discovering them. And the result of this was that the students would produce a work that contained biological material, but they had to be very conscious of their responsibility in doing that. So they had to feed and care for their work over the duration. Um, and in terms of ethics, when we think about our ethics applications for PhD research, 
uh, I asked for an unprecedented request from the arts, which was to have animals in my artwork, as well as the human studies. And the fact that they took that on board and uh, accepted that process was, was quite something. Okay. I'll just, just go back to this for a moment. Um, there you can see Nick extracting his DNA and that had a really profound effect on him and, and that will be embodied in an artwork I will show you later. So the research advocates interdisciplinary education but also interdisciplinary action. Um, my methodology uses reflexivity, praxis and participatory action. So as the students were producing their works and discussing things, I would cater the uh, lessons to suit the situation and their particular interests. Um, but also in, on top of that I conducted surveys so I could get some quantitative research to feed into the process of um, collecting information. Um, and I collected this from the students and the teachers. And some of the responses were things like students enjoyed the crossing of disciplines. They had never thought of that before. They also enjoyed the freedom of choosing self-directed projects. The teachers could see potential futures in this methodology in terms of crossing other disciplines in order to generate new forms of knowledge methodologies. So another aspect of my work is to show art pieces that are in different locations, so out of the ivory tower. So I'll show you a couple examples of my work in a moment. Um, what I tend to do is I show my work in places like festivals, royal agricultural shows, pubs, anywhere that's sort of a place I can set it up quickly basically so that the, you know, the demographic of the audience is diverse. There's talk lately of the fact that perhaps are we talking amongst ourselves uh, with our content sometimes. So this work here is the third prong to my research. So I had my own practice, the educational aspect and also the process of curation. And what you're looking at here is the work of Angela Singer. And I heard about her work at the Animal Studies Conference in 2011. And what she does is that she re-embodies animals that have been um, killed from hunt for hunting purposes. In New Zealand, it's actually something that still happens um, in our time. And she's an animal activist and artist so she uses recycled, discarded hunting trophies, gently restoring and bejeweling their bodies uh, to trace what each animal has experienced. And she reminds us that all too often the animal's welfare is determined by the cultural value it's placed within. So the premise for this particular curation uh, is for the abdication of spaces that have multiple uses. So that they res uh, support real-time interactions and create spaces that are a wilderness for um, other living things and a site for education. A bit not unlike the forest gallery we've got at the Melbourne Museum. The curation of Creatures of the Future Garden aimed to show the diversity of the bioarts practice, deal with current issues, place established local and global artists alongside students, to make connections for the viewer between the materiality of the works, subject matter and their life world, to engender action. And each piece framed how we're considering our engagements with non-human life. So here are some other works by Angela. And my colleague said he's never going to think of buttons the same way again. Uh, it's a bit dark. but This is another piece I've done in collaboration with Peter Minson. He has a long history of producing glass works that he learnt from his father uh, for scientific purposes, so already he has that intimate connection with material. Uh, this is using the, the skin that was also used to produce the garments and it's a starting point for the exhibition in terms of getting people to think about our intimate connections with animals and the philosophies behind this. It's a capuchin monkey who um, learn, uh, creates its own tools uh, taken from footage, the action, uh, and this knowledge is passed on from generation to generation through the monkeys. 
It's also contemplating a human skull, so it references that particular sculpture. It stands atop the dialectic of enlightenment, status anxiety, and the origin of the species. The other work I had in the show, which was an introduction to the space, was the recreation of my own suburban garden. And really, it is, in a sense, a didactic work. Uh, the intention is to encourage people to replicate this in their own lives. Um, it was also responding to the local flora and fauna that was around. And, and also drawing from our association between parks, public spaces and private spaces. What was really exciting about this work for me was that the local wildlife actually used it as a source of nourishment during the exhibition. Uh, Kirsten Hudson, who is a local WA artist, has had a long practice of working with sugar. It's often to do with uh, concepts of the body, the female form, and representations of commodification. So because of that long history of working with sugar, She's had a constant struggle with ants invading her home, her studio, uh, her bedroom. It's, it's rather endless. So when she uh, heard about my call out for works, she was very keen to respond to that conundrum in an ethical manner. And the whole process of her collecting the ants was quite a fascinating one. Because part of, part of this uh, exhibition was that I had a symposium where the artist would talk to the public too. And she discovered that she was going on an ant hunt and that she wasn't scared. <laughs> However, she collected the wrong ant. <laughs> and as a result, it was rather upset about being disrupted and a little bit aggressive. And she discovered that uh, ants have facial recognition. So being the one that put them in the jar in the first place, Whenever her face would go past, they would try and attack the glass. Her children, however, walked past, not a peep. I know. So the complexity of, of life around us is, is more than we, we, we think of sometimes. So what she wanted to do here was collaborate with indigenous uh, sugar ants, and she created some ant chow especially for them. And what they were going to do was disrupt the pattern of uh, human, non-human dichotomies, coloner and colonised, male and female, to resist assimilation and main alterity in, in the face of technological power. That's her quote. And this did happen to an extent, but it also made a few people angry about the fact that we were recontextualising their environment. So this is, brings up another issue with the arts in terms of, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we will often just wipe out entire um, areas of biodiversity and not think about it. This is particularly evident in Perth where there's a lot of high density unit building going on and whole blocks of land are being cleared to be replaced by houses with no gardens at all, which of course requires cooling in our hot weather. Um, so we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that Kirsten brought this into the context of arts and, and brought it to our attention made people angry but also made them realise that actually this is what we do all the time. George Gesser uh, is famously known for his long-standing um, close relationship with the hybridisation of irises. And uh, when I put the call out, he was very keen to produce a new work, uh, talking about the relationships between our day-to-day -day actions and climate change. So this piece is called The Fern Age. And he says that we too, if we continue to consume fossil fuels the way we do, we too will become coal. So it was a very quiet, poignant work and viewers and young, young people really got this straight away. They were really quite taken by the embodiment of what he was talking about. Tash Bates uh, is a performing artist and she, sp she uh, like boys, she's, she spends a long time with the creatures she works with, um, like scientists do also on a daily basis. So what she explored in this work was the relationship between body and other organism, the cared and the cared for. 
but she also debunks the whole process of biological arts where she asks, is it appropriate for us to contain organisms in glass terrariums to keep them for our own purposes, aesthetic, cultural or scientific? And that I think is a good question because that's something we always have to be mindful of when we're dealing with wet biology, is that we have um, a responsibility to that life. And what she has uh, shown here is the, the fruit fly, which has a two week life cycle. So the viewer would see that whole process of birth, life and death over the duration of the exhibition. Kirst, uh, Sonia Kratz had three pieces in the show and this one refers to the world turtle, so I'll just go to the next one. Uh, she poetically plays with how we classify life and, and to try and break down the anthropocentric engagements that often frame the bioarts discourse. What was really great for me to see was the fact that people would then be quite fascinated with the interplay between poetry, living, non-living and death here in these objects that are museological in, in nature, but aesthetic also. And what they tended to do was take lots of photos and then post this onto Facebook. So the work had another life beyond the real-time experience that was taking place. And I really love that interplay between reality and, and digital records. But I'd really like to focus on her other work here that she had in the show. Um, she often works with cell tissue culture and uh, she researched the history of the serum that is used to support the cells. It's called uh, FCS or fetal calf serum. I'm not quite sure how many of you are familiar with that but it's a very um, old technology. And uh, she wanted to know how this came about so she re researched the origin and she discovered that part of the meat industry, one of the, the byproducts of the process of, of abattoirs is that sometimes pregnant cows are slaughtered. And uh, so she was quite horrified to hear this. So she went to the abattoir and collected a, uh, a young calf, thinking it would be small and pink, but it was actually almost full term. And just, just for a pause for a moment, because I was going to add something else to my anecdotes at the beginning, but another thing that spurred on this interest between science, technology, life, and the support systems that are around it is the fact that I was um, 16 weeks prematurely born, which means I was about this big. Uh, and that was at King Edward Memorial Hospital in 81. And my brother James, who was 24 weeks, so he would have been about this big when he was born, we were both pretty keen to, you know, get started. Um, yes, I know. But apparently I just flew out. They had to catch me like a football. The power there of muscles. Anyway, um, unfortunately James, because he was born uh, a few years, uh, well, half a decade earlier, uh, didn't quite make it. So he's actually somewhere in Sydney in a, in a museum. Um, and one of the first uh, introductions to how technology supports and, and, and shapes life is that in Coney Island, they would have a show uh, of premature babies, which, which would travel the world to show how they could keep things alive outside of the womb, which I think is quite, quite profound. Anyway, that's a tangent that just popped in. Uh, so with uh, Svenja's work, uh, she was looking at uh, cancer cells and uh, in particular the cells of Henrietta Lacks whose tissue was taken from her in 1951, a South African American woman, um, without her consent. So again that close relationship between uh, politics and action. Uh, it's only recently been acknowledged, it's actually called now the million dollar cell. And the cell, as colleagues have said before, has now been reproduced because it's a mortal cell line, it will never die. And that's, that's its, its, um, its wonder and usefulness in the research, is that it's now been reproduced beyond the entire mass of her body. Um, it's used globally. Um, and what Kratz is talking about here, she has a fixed fl um, flask of the healer cell line in this work as well, is that she's not wanting to point blame, she's just wanting to point out that uh, she's exploring the boundaries of right and wrong and that every um, aspect of life 
has an aspect of death in it as well. That without uh, the use of the fetal calf serum, there's a lot of medical research that wouldn't be able to take place. So she's just wanting to point out things that happen in our life world that we might not necessarily experience or know about. Uh, Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, based in the UK, looks at the concept of synthetic life and how we might need to add potentially a new branch to the tree of life as we start to design nature. So again, it's breaking down that relationship between uh, the human and the non-human because we're all on an equal footing. We could all be sourced as a form of biological material. Another thing that she's doing which is quite fascinating is the concept of uh, adding bacteria to the body that measures its health through colour. And also the concept of uh, alchemy by creating works or sculptures that, um, how do I put this delicately? So when one eats food, there is a process that takes place, yes. We all know the end point of that point, the solid food, yes. So she's talking about what happens if that food could then change in your stomach and then at that end point you produce gold. Yep, okay. So she's playing around with, with that idea as well. She's pr produced a number of sculptures for that. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't have those in my show, but it gives you a taste of her sense of humour. Has anyone heard of the cloaca machine? Yes, okay. Uh, the other film that I had in, in the show was by uh, local artist Trish Adams. And this was based on her experience with bees. And she's very much interested into looking into the shivering boundaries um, between human, non-human, and cellular molecular biology. And this was taken on, on footage that was very, very slow, so you could see all the nuances of um, the bees as they landed on her hands. And what was lovely to see is that viewers would make associations between this experience of the film and their own experiences with bees, either positive, negative or, or benign. Uh, the following works are from the high school students that I had originally worked with um, doing the art science uh, projects. And th they come under a certain theme. They're, in they're looking into body politics and, and future um, combinations of life. Uh, with Jesse, he was looking at the dichotomy between male, female, cyborg, organic and inorganic. Um, again, adapting the technology we use to produce the wine dress, he's using it to produce a, a living sculpture. Um, what's also interesting now that he's produced this hybrid work is that we're now, we're now in a, a phase where we now have bionic hearts that no longer have a heartbeat. So I was thinking uh, about the lovely performance we had, we started our day with yesterday, which was very much based on breathing and internal movements and heartbeats and pulses. And the great thing I was just saying to some friends earlier is that as I was just drifting off to sleep uh, at 4 a.m. this morning, um, the, uh, I, I revisited that, it came into my mind that those sounds that she was producing, which was a lovely way to begin and end my day. But then I was thinking about what if, what if she had a bionic heart that has no pulse? How does that change our sense of who we are as human beings, as living creatures? Something to think about. And the fact that when you expire, say if, if, it's, if, if it's a brain-related situation, um, your heart will continue because these things are machines and they just keep going. So while, while you're decomposing, the machine will, will still be doing its thing. Yes, anyway, I'll just leave that one for you to ponder over. Okay, and again, this is talking about these unknown places we, we live in, these unknown times. Uh, as I was saying, Nick was profoundly uh, influenced by the, the process, of, process of extracting his own DNA. And he was concerned that in the future, perhaps insurance companies might start to measure um, how much they're going to insure you based on your genetic code and the predetermined uh, diseases and so forth you could potentially have. There is a history of this, so I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. Um, so he put his, his DNA in a safe 
to make sure nobody could get to it. And he really enjoyed seeing his friends try and crack it open on opening night. Um, and Nick now is an absolute expert in extracting DNA. I have never seen so many samples in my entire life. He just kept popping them out. It was just, he was, it was just a machine. It was amazing. And they're good quality samples. So, you know, I'm, I'm expecting that he'll be in demand quite soon. Uh, with uh, these pieces here, as I was saying before, I collaborate with Gary Cass on scientific projects. And this concept of collaboration, uh, for me, needs to be defined as something that's equal. Um, often, initially in these situations, you have the artist working on the concepts and the scientist doing the technologies. What Gary and I do is that everything is equal, which of course can uh, create tension, but uh, we're working through that. Um, what we tend to do is that we now exchange roles. So, he might go into a school and teach the art and use the language. He hasn't started wearing black yet, but I'm working on that. <laughs> um, and I might go in and, and teach the science. And what we've got here is the collaboration between uh, him and his wife and uh, his family and the people of Perth. So again, getting the community involved in a hands-on, dirty way. And what we've done here is extracted their DNA and created a generic, standardised base. Uh, Sasha Whittle uh, has created a self-portrait and what she's also done um, in this time is produce the first DNA portrait of Rosalind Franklin, which now hangs in the Franklin Wilkins Museum in London, UK. And that was tremendous, absolutely tremendous, that a 16-year-old girl has a work in the Franklin Wilkins Institute. Um, and what I actually really loved about having these students in the exhibition was that it broke down this established kind of emerging artist versus established artist dialogue. Um, what was great to see is the fact that these artists are coming together and discussing things on the ground as we've been doing and that is one of the most vital um, things in terms of knowledge generation. What was also lovely to see with these students is that they demonstrated a clear understanding of the science they were using the ethical implications, they talked about it really confidently to the public and the intentions for doing that. And they're only 16. There's so much potential in each individual. So with that in mind, and thinking of the idea of creating spaces that have multiple uses, I have this vision. So if there are any patrons out there, what I really want to do, and I think you know, it's commonly becoming an interesting thing now, um, is to create a space that's a laboratory uh, dedicated to the exhibition of, of non-human life, but also can be interchangeable with education, has a site for wilderness, um, but it also can be a studio or lived-in space. So I haven't got anywhere yet, but I'm really wanting to do it. So guys, if you want to get on board, give me a call. Uh, so part of this process, apart from having the exhibition in this one-on-one -on -one engagement with works, was to have a live birds of prey workshop and Oscar the owl featured in opening night and he also was mistook for being an anatomic bird. <laughs> so he was a bit miffed about that one because he's worked really hard at being real. <laughs> However, he is quite popular and he also makes a particular noise on cue. He goes whoop whoop, whoop whoop. Has anyone heard that at night when you're coming home from a party? Yeah, no, just me, okay, fair enough. Um, now, Yvonne has an intimate relationship with her birds. She's, she's dedicated her whole life to this, as artists do and as scientists do. They dedicate their whole life. And she can tell us all sorts of stories about the, the birds that were involved. Um, some that have been blind, she's rehabilitated. Um, Ozzy the eagle, she flies around the football stadium, so Mount Hawthorne people, watch out. Uh, it is Mount Hawthorne or is it Essendon? I don't actually follow football. What, what goes on here? Anyway, you get the gist. So, um, Ozzy the eagle also had been stolen from the environment as an egg and was terrified of trees and didn't know how to fly. And uh, she re rehabilitated that bird. So that something, is something in itself. But what was most important for me is that the fact that it's the next generation that we're working towards here. Life is full of complexity and culture is dynamic. We've established this over the last three days. 
As cultural communicators and critical thinkers, we have an opportunity to extend our outreach through interdisciplinary praxis. The education systems and infrastructures need to reflect this diversity. In order to problem solve the future and respond to our current times, there needs to be more intergenerational knowledge building and cross-disciplinary problem solving of thought and action through praxis. I mean, just thinking about the experience last night of the performance, how different our world would be if we'd actually collaborated with Indigenous cultures rather than annihilated them. I mean, there's, oh, there's, uh, we have six seasons, and I think Melbourne has 12, but, uh, you know, just changing our understanding of how we engage with the world. So thank you. <laughs>